with service, then they will never know pain again. Revelation 21, 4. We will have perfect bodies. They'll never be sick again. Then we will never have health problems again. Our new bodies will be well forever. And last of all, they will never be homeless again. John 14, 2. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. That place is the new Jerusalem. And the poet sums it all up, I believe, in a song that I discovered recently. It goes like this. Some glorious morning, sorrow will cease. Some glorious morning, all will be peace. Heartaches all ended. School days all done. Heaven will open. Jesus will come. Sad hearts will gladden. All shall be bright. Goodbye forever to earth's dark night. Changed in a moment like Him to be. O oh, glorious daybreak, Jesus I'll see. Oh, what a meeting there in the skies. No tears, nor crying, nor shall dim our eyes. Loved ones united eternally. Oh, what a daybreak that morn will be. Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, battles all won. He'll shout the victory. Break through the blue, some golden daybreak for me and for you. It's going to be a wonderful day when the Lord comes for us. And I believe the rapture of the saints is very, very near. All the signs point to it. All the preachers are preaching on it. All the people are expected. And they will not be disappointed. He will come. And he'll catch us up into glory. Now I want to move over into the fact that unless Jesus rose from the dead, none of these blessings that I mentioned will be true. But he did rise from the dead. He is alive right now. And Luke begins his gospel by showing that the disciples had the evidence of their own senses. There was a great scientist by the name of Faraday and some newspaper people came to Mr. Faraday and said, Mr. Faraday, would you give us your suppositions about life after death? He said, speculations? I know nothing about speculations. What I do know is that my Lord rose from the dead and he will bring me with him in his glory. Amen. So the disciples of our Lord had a privilege that we don't have. They were in the physical presence of the Lord. And we have to wait to get to heaven for his physical presence. But we have his spiritual presence with us all the time. First of all, they saw him. That's the evidence of sight. And he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. They saw him. We call that physiognomy. Then secondly, they heard him. That's the evidence of sound. We call that phrenology. Acts 1.3 To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, that is his death, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's called phrenology. Thirdly, they touched him. That's the evidence of somatology. John 20 Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, 
which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. So mythology is empirical knowledge, practical experience. And then, last of all, they ate with him. That's the evidence of substantialism. Luke 24, 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. But he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. Now a spirit does not eat. He ate with them. I want to move on now to the all-encompassing range of facts. People today are of a doubting mind and the only thing that will dispel doubts is facts. So we can go to the Bible and we can discover the facts that they permeate every part of society. One fact after another. And I list them here. The all-encompassing range of facts as they relate to the resurrection of our Lord from the dead. First, His resurrection is a scriptural fact. 1 Corinthians 15, But now is Christ risen from the dead. Again, it's a philosophical fact. His words, Never man spake like this man. The philosophers have to agree. Philosophy is taken from two Greek words, philo, sophia. Philo is the word for love in Greek, and sophia, the word for wisdom. So philosophers claim to have the love of wisdom. If they have the love of wisdom, then they will believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Thirdly, it's a ceremonial fact. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are two ceremonies in Romans 6 that portrays His death, burial, and resurrection. Then it's a prophetic fact. Psalm 16.10 declares, Thou wilt not leave my soul in Sheol, the abode of departed spirits. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Matthew, or Psalm 16.10. Then fifthly, it's a historical fact. Acts 1.3. He showed himself alive after his passion. Then it's an institutional fact. We have the Lord's Day delineated into two parts. A.D. and B.C. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Jesus changed the calendars. The times were changed with his birth. It's an institutional fact. Then it's an ecclesiological fact. The church is here this morning. It's been here 2,000 years. And his church still stands today. Amen. He said the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Amen. And it will not. Then it's a psychological fact. The transfer 
of the disciples as they were transformed by faith in Christ. Psychology is the study of human behavior. Uh, there are very few psychologists that know the Lord. They have a little trouble for some reason. I don't know why. They shouldn't. It's a psychological fact. If you study the transforming effect of the disciples after they met the Lord, you have to get, give us some kind of an explanation for that. And the only explanation for that fact is that they were psychologically moved to believe the gospel and be saved. And then again, it's a typological fact. Jonah is a type of Christ as he was bended out of the whale's belly onto dry land. Noah's heart is another typological fact of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Then it's a soteriological fact. Soteriology is a word we use for Bible doctrine. The scripture says, if thou shalt believe in thine heart, thou shalt be saved. And the conversion of the Apostle Paul was a theological fact as this little missionary went throughout all of Europe and Asia preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it's an experiential fact. Paul could say, Christ liveth in me. I can say that this morning. Christ liveth in me. Amen. I know that. <coughs> Nobody can take that away from me. In the coming days, they may chop my head off. They may burn me at the stake. But they cannot take away what and who lives in my heart. Amen. I know Him. He is in me. He is in me 70 years now as I have preached the gospel. And for 96 years He has lived in me. Then it's also a literary fact. Benjamin Franklin he was a very witty individual, one of the founders of our country in America. And he went to England. And there he visited a lodge of unbelievers who scoffed at the resurrection of Christ. And each person that came was invited to give a story. And so he came and they invited him to tell us his story. And he said, I want to tell you a beautiful story. And he gave them the gospel story of Luke and the gospel story of Boaz. Mary Ruth. And when he related the glorious, beautiful story of Ruth from the Gospel of John, they clapped their hands and they said, that was a wonderful story. We have never heard that story before. Where did you get that story? He said, my friends, it's in the Bible which you don't believe. And uh, they were astonished to know that they had lauded and glorified the Bible story as they were unbelievers. Then last of all, it's a judicial fact. At this time, the ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men 
in that he hath raised him from the dead. We do not worship a dead Christ. We worship a living Lord. Amen. And then it is a judicial and essential fact. We read, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you are yet in your sins. But he has been raised. He is alive today. And these facts that I've just related to you, in every realm of society, are incontrovertible, undeniable, and irrefutable. Now I move to another line of evidence. How many people giving a story can make it a fact? In a court of law, Two or three people can constitute a fact of law. So I want to give you the facts this morning. And you can just count them as we go along. They're all found in this New Testament. And every one of them testifies to the resurrection of Christ from the dead. We call those epiphanies. Epiphany means an appearance or a sight. He was sighted by a great many people after he rose from the dead. We'll start with Mary Magdalene in John 20. Mary Magdalene saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. Mark 16, 9. Then secondly, to the women returning from the tomb, the empty tomb, in Matthew 28. Then thirdly, he was seen of Peter later in the day, Luke 24, 34. Then he was seen of the two of the many disciples going to Emmaus in the evening, Luke 24, 13. Fifthly, he was seen of the apostles, except Thomas in the upper room, Luke 24, 36. These five were made on the resurrection day. On the very day that Jesus arose from the dead, these five different groups of people all saw him alive. Now I move on to five more. Number six, to the apostles a week later, Thomas being present. John 20, 24. And then seven. In Galilee, to the seven by the lake of Tiberias, John 21. Then in Galilee, on the mountain, to the apostles and the 500 believers. 500 believers saw him at one time. And they were all still alive at that time, so all one had to do it in biblical times would just go to any one of these 500 men and they would be told, yes, we saw him alive from the dead. Then to Jerusalem, to the Apostle James, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, and then again at Olivet and at the Ascension, Acts 1, 3. Now these five were made during the 40 days from the resurrection to the Ascension. Now we have five more. That will make 15. To Paul near Damascus, Acts 9, 3. Then to Stephen outside of Jerusalem, Acts 7, 55. And then again to the Apostle Paul in the temple, Acts 22, 17. And then to Paul on a ship in the Mediterranean Sea in Acts 27. And then to John, the Apostle, on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation 1, 10. These five were made during the next 50 to 60 years after his resurrection. <laughs> now, if it only takes two or three witnesses to make the fact of a statement, 
Then we have 15 witnesses here, plus 500 at one time. How many facts do you need? Right. Actually, when you read the Bible, you can read it one time in the Bible, and that makes it a fact. If nobody else did. But here are 15 different people, one of them being a group of men, 500, all testify that they saw Jesus after his resurrection from the dead. So how many, how many proofs does a person need to believe the testimony of that many people? These were honorable people. These were people that testified to the truth. Their witness is indisputable, undeniable, and unassailable. So I quickly go through my outline. The Old Testament foretold it in prophecy. Psalm 16, 9 through 10. In type with Isaac in Genesis 22, 2. Secondly, Christ himself predicted it. John 10, 17. I have power, he said, to take it up again. I have power to lay it down again. My Father hath given me this power. Thirdly, the New Testament records it. It's a historical fact. Acts 1, 3. It's the basis of all Bible doctrine. The whole structure of Christianity rests upon the teaching that Christ rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith also vain. The fourth place, the empty tomb demands it. The tomb was empty, Luke 24. And the question comes then, what became of the body? If Jesus was buried on, in a tomb and they found the tomb was empty, what happened to the body? There's only one conclusion we can come to. The disciples did not steal away his body. They would not have done that. For they would have been so happy to have him back. And his enemies did not steal his body because they would have been glad to take his body before Pilate and say, here he is, he's, he's dead, here's his body. But they couldn't do that because there was no body in the tomb. He arose from the tomb and walked away and saw all these other people after his resurrection. So what became of his body? His body rose from the dead on the third day. And he walked out of his tomb alive and saw all these people that I just stated. There's only one satisfactory explanation of the empty tomb, and that is that Christ arose from the dead. Amen. The Bible says that it was a physical resurrection. Don't let anybody tell you that it was just a spiritual resurrection. They do that to try to deny the physical resurrection of his body. You can't get away with that because that won't work. The Bible says in Acts 2.31, Neither did his flesh see corruption. You know, when Lazarus died, Jesus said his body has already begun to see corruption. That's the body of Lazarus. But here, Jesus' body saw no corruption. Not one bit of corruption. Cowards became bold. Doubters were convinced. Discouragement changed to assurance. Rejectors were converted. All of those things happened because of the resurrection. And sixthly, the experience of believers confirms it. 
We know that Christ lives because He lives in us. We have received His resurrection life. Romans 6, 11. We commune in fellowship with the living Christ. Colossians 3 and verse 1. What does it mean to commune with Christ? I talked to Him this morning. I had communion with Him this morning. I talked to him for a while before we came to church. Christians have communion with their Lord. They can talk to him. They tell him all their troubles. He answers their prayers. We know him. We know him experientially. He is in us. And then last of all, belief in Christ's resurrection is part of the gospel. <clears throat> the gospel is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And the third day, He rose again from the dead. Amen. If you read the gospel of that last part, deny His resurrection, then everything that I've said this morning would be a lie. But if he rose from the dead, and he did, then everything I've said this morning is the truth. It would be much harder to deny the resurrection of the Lord than it would to manufacture a fable or a story that's false. There were two men. They were scientists in England. I have their names in my office. They were unbelievers, and they believed that Jesus died and stayed dead. So they decided to put it to a test. One of them said, I'm going to go over and disprove the resurrection of Christ. And he went to the Holy Land in Israel to do that. The other said, I'm going to go and prove that he didn't rise from the dead. And they both went over there and they spent a year studying archaeology, going through all the places where Jesus had preached. And they came back. And they had a meeting with their unbelieving friends in their lodge. And the people, the unbelieving people, waited expectantly to find their evidence that Jesus did not rise from the dead. And the first one said, well, I come to tell you that I studied every facet of Jesus' life. And I studied his resurrection. And I studied all of that with an unbelieving mind. But he said, I am today a Christian because the evidence proved it to me. The other man came the next day. They met with him. And he said the same thing. I went over there to disprove the resurrection of Christ. And I have become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because the evidence convinced me. So I would ask you this morning, are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. I've given you all the evidence from the Scripture. You have no excuse not to believe it. It's the truth. Amen. And right now, I'm going to add one more little thing to this. And that is this. That in our society today, something has happened, especially to the unbelievers, because they are witnessing a strange phenomenon taking place right today in our land Something is happening and they don't know what it is. Even the unbelievers are sensing 
that something is going to happen, but they don't know what. I can tell you what. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back soon. It wouldn't surprise me if He came back today. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. He's coming, folks. That's the main part of my message that I wanted to bring this morning. He is coming. Amen. He's on the way. I don't know when He will come. I cannot set a date. But I know He's coming. I feel it. I sense it. I'm sure of it. I'm waiting to meet Him in the air as we're caught up in His presence. If you don't know Him, trust Him today, and He will save you and give you joy and life eternal. And you'll never know the meaning of death. You'll go to be with the Lord. Let's bow together as we stand for prayer.